Don't you think it's time for the city of Savannah to have an honest tourism management plan? Let SCAB start paying its fair share? And the hospitality industry needs to increase its wages? The impacts of new growth should not cost residents. All local elected officials on council and commission should have term limits. We're working hard to accomplish these policies. We need your help. Please contribute whatever you can, five, 10 or $20, by going to bettersavannah.org. Donate. Thank you. Yep. Good evening, Facebook. It's Thursday, April 22nd, and this is episode number 34 of our Better Savannah uh, Discussions uh, podcast. Um, we're very happy to be joined by Dr. Ramir Torre today. I'll get to our guest in just a moment, but I want to go ahead and announce uh, our, our show for next week. We, we had on at the last part of our, our show with Senator Regina Thomas, we had on the head of the Victorian Neighborhood Association, Ryan Madsen, about this redesign of the Forsyth Park. And so we have put together a show for next Thursday uh, where we will have representation from the Downtown Neighborhood Association, the Victorian Neighborhood Association, the Thomas Square Neighborhood Association, and also from the Friends of Forsyth uh, group committee uh, that has put together these two plans for a redesign of our city's Forsyth Park uh, that we all know and love. So next week, we will have a special panel show, uh, probably somewhere in the ballpark of 90 minutes, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I, I expect that to be a very uh, good discussion since, um, you know, they're going through all of those individual council members uh, Zoom town halls on the issue right now. Uh, so just want to go ahead and throw that out there. City Council's meeting right now. I'm not really sure uh, if there's any fireworks going on, but uh, we're going to have a, a great show here tonight. Uh, joining us this evening is Dr. Amir Jamal Torre. Dr. Torre is, uh, really needs no introduction, is a, is a local legend, uh, is, is Savannah's historian uh, in many uh, regards. Uh, and is a longtime uh, member of uh, the academia here in the local university community. I, of course, we've known each other a long time, Dr. Torre. You know, uh, a lot of people don't know this. You uh, were an advisor to my fraternity, the latest and greatest Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. That's it. You got it. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing you just outside of the public capacity and, and in a private manner and I've always respected you and appreciated your leadership and advisement. And uh, I've really loved your activism here in the last year or so. I mean, just it just seems like every 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 day we've got a new issue. How, how are you doing, uh, Dr. Torre? 
we're, we're glad to be here. We're doing excellent. No need to complain. I said we always go forward. And uh, and Chuck, just to let you know, I'm still the advisor for Eta Gamma. Eta Gamma. I got mad love for Eta Gamma chapter. That's how you came into Idol Phi Theta. So you know, mad love. And so uh, we're going forward. We're looking at things and they're still assessing things because it's important. Just like with Better Savannah, reformation through policy, reformation through policy, and that's what we constantly got the the outlook on. Looking at policy, looking at changes that's for the betterment of all people. Absolutely. So, yeah, we're doing good, brother. Glad to be here with Commissioner uh, McMaster and Sister Carrie and yourself, Brother Chuck. Yes. Well, you are um, a kind of a, a, a I, don't, I wouldn't say the leader, but a leader of a voice of uh, critics of our local government, our city council, how they've been acting. Uh, and you are very highly established. People see you on, you know, the news during Black History Month. You know, people know your your face. And like us, you, you know these people on council. You went to college with many of them. You've known many of them for, for, for many, many years. Um, and, 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 and one thing you and Reverend Leonard Small have articulated very well is that, you know, this isn't personal. You know, this is, you know, just because we don't like what you're doing doesn't mean we think you're a bad person. Uh, you, you gave some comments during this weeping time saga, which I want to get more into with you here in a moment uh, to that effect. Why don't you just talk a little bit about that, about navigating the personal versus the public in the political realm? And, and Chuck, um, this goes back in time. It goes back to our Savannah State College experience, our Savannah State University experience. And again, I tell folks that, and I put it out there, I support the mayor. I believe in the mayor. I voted for the mayor. I'll still vote for the mayor, pretty much. I will still do that. So it's not anything personal with regards to this. And with regards to some of our politicians, they take it personal. That no, it's about, again, what we talk about policies. And one of the things that we learned and what we knew from Savannah State on, and some of us have still allowed that seed to be planted, you know, I should, I should say, We've still allowed that seed to germinate within us and for us to function, understand that we can get to achieve our goals through various methods and means. But sometimes some of our methods and means may not be the proper way to go. So some of us can come along and share some information as to what might be better or what might be a route. But then we have people who didn't take it personal and they didn't get upset. Or I should say this. Let me put it out there. Victor Cooper and I, I had this conversation with him. This is over two years ago. I said that we have an issue of political groupies. And that's what I'm going to see the political groupies who now come in and they fester. They now begin to support this, uh, again, this personality cult thing that happens with some of us. They begin to help support, again, with regards to the personal stuff, taking it all personal. Why am I saying no? When you are an elected official, you got to accept what the people tell you. You have to accept because you chose to make that decision and not make that foray. As a private citizen, it's different. I even tell folks, when I post something on Facebook, and depending on how people respond, I got to accept that because I put it out there. I put something out there for the public to respond and say something too. So I can't get upset with people when they respond and it might not be in a way that I like. So I tell folks, when you are an elected official, or excuse me, elected servant, I like how someone said that the other night, an elected servant, it is your job to listen to the people, not brush them off, because you represent the people. You are a servant of us. And that's why, again, I am adamant that we cannot function like that. And you might think that we can. I'm saying to the groupies out there, you might think that's what we should do, but you are absolutely wrong because that hurts all of us. Because again, you're so isolated with regards to your thoughts and your opinions that you're not taking in the thoughts from everyone else. A synthesis is what we believe in. Go ahead, John. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it, it's so nice to meet you this way. I, I wish it was in person. I'll see you soon. <clears throat> <clears throat> we'll do it uh, in real time. But I, I just want you to know I've always admired your, uh, your clear-eyed uh, conversations. And what you were talking about, about people not even understanding the history of religion and the Martin Luther Reformation of Protestantism, man, that, that got me right here. And, you know, I was, I was feeling it in a big way because we believe that 
you know, the, the Catholic Church is no longer, to use the metaphor, the example, the Catholic Church is taking advantage of us. Um, <clears throat> we shouldn't have to pay uh, for absolution or, uh, you know, blessings. And that was what happened. You know, he tacked it to the door and, and, and off we went. So we, we, in our own little humble, small way, and it was kind of Chuck's and my coming together just organically in the community five, six years ago in, in that mayoral election. And Chuck said, you know, maybe we should try a different venue or a different mechanism to solidify what we both agree on. And so here we are. And that, that's kind of our, our history. Um, I, we, we have said, and I want to get your take on this, Dr. Torre. Um, you know, I've been here almost 30 years and, and I maintain that the 2019 city elections were not only remarkable, but historic and possibly revolutionary. Okay, because we took out seven members of a nine council and replaced them. A uh, couple weren't running, but point is the people that we wanted in those positions got elected. A lot of those races were razor thin. Now we know that there, there, there's, there's been <clears throat> some spinoff and derision am among some of those members. But uh, what, what did, do you agree that that 2019 election was uh, historic and unique in, in its nature? Um, uh, Commissioner McMaster's, I'm gonna share this with you too. I threw it out there. Uh, my boy, my friend, Najanir Enzi, he's always <laughs> talking about John McMaster's. He's always talking about him. <laughs> so, and Najwa and I have conversations all right. throughout the entire week. We, he and I talked earlier. And what we talked about when I shared with him, sure. it was absolutely historic. This is what this is the first time that I, I, I share with folks that we now see the people really making yep. a change. The people made a change. The people decided as to who they want to be in leadership positions to now make a change for all of Savannah, to have a better Savannah. That's what that was, excuse me, I should say, those were the thoughts that many of us had. That's what the masses of the people want to see. They want to see this change that now is going to rectify some of the ills that have been happening, some of the issues that occurred in city hall, in city government, that now we were really going to say, we're going to have people that are going to create policies that's going to be beneficial to all of Savannah, not continuing the same legacy that has been going on. Mm. And that's a part mm. of what we're going to see. Even if they're not specifically doing it, their actions, and just give you a backdrop, this is something that I share with folks. I said that we have elected officials here in the city who are just happy to go to the Italian club the Yacht Club, to the German Club. They're just happy to go sit there and drink wine and sip wine with them. And then let them be, and then be told what should happen. Then they go and parrot that. What we thought in 2019, that we were not gonna be really dictating what should happen in the community overall, that was the benefit to all of us. And that's absolutely, I would dare say, that was the, 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 the temperature of the community. That was the thermometer of the community. That was again the pulse of the community. That's but what we believe. That the temperature has been off. That again is lukewarm now. That the thermometer is not functioning, and that the pulse is basically not having any life for the people. Let, 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 let me ask you a, a follow up. I don't I don't know if you read the Savannah Morning News and Adam Van Bremer is where I'm going with this. Okay, mm -hmm. um, the the guy is on. Uh, a jag against the four people uh, that we support and love and like. Um, it reminds me of the uh, uh, vicious uh, constant attacks against Jolene Byrne. When the media wants to target somebody, and I'm talking Savannah Morning News, uh, it, it is it, it is just remarkable. Now, uh, I. I fired back a, a response to Adam and uh, Adam, I, I told Adam he's on the wrong side and he will be on the wrong side of history, okay? Um, and it occurred to me that really, 
for, forgetting the deep ties to the oligarchy institutions here that are all powerful, but very few in number, okay? Yes. But they have this, this sweeping uh, influence. Um, uh, Van Bremer is, is, his complaint is that the, the four members of council aren't professional enough for him, okay? They're not uh, wordsmiths. They're uh, contentious. You know what? Um, reconstruction. <laughs> Let's do the history thing, okay? Reconstruction was messy. I'm sorry. It, it's part. It, it's part of the process. It is part of the moment. And to nitpick them. Well, I, I want to let Dr. Troy respond, but I just want to throw in here. Sure. Coming from one of four or five newspapers in the country that endorsed Donald J. Trump for president. You know, and I understand Van Brimmer was not there at the time, but you took the job, right? You know, I, I, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything other than that. And I just think it's rich coming from a paper that endorsed, you know, a plain fool con man who has not an ounce of professionalism compared to these four black women on council. Uh, I just kind of find that risk. Dr. Torre, your, your thoughts. <laughs> I had shared years ago something about the Savannah Morning News. The Savannah Morning News Commissioner McMaster has always been on the wrong side of progression. They have always historically been on the wrong side. From the 1800s, early 1900s, even during the civil rights movement, they were on the opposite side. They were proponents of segregation and still with regards to Jim Crowism, they were supporters of that. And I tell folks, I say, wait a minute, you got to look at this and you have to call them out. So when you said that, yes, what's going on with Van Bremer is a continuation of that type of madness. And so what happens so often for many of us, we don't go back and look at it and then assess that and say, wow, it's the continuation. And that's it exactly. That again, they attacked leadership that was progressive leadership. And when you threw up about reconstruction, that's when we now get a public school system here. So some of the very people here who, in Georgia, it comes out of reconstruction. When we talk about enfranchisement, when we look at that, it's coming out of reconstruction. But then we know there's an element there who the haves who want to maintain the have not down and that they did that to people of color and to Caucasians. Because again, and that's, and that's what they try to do constantly. Savannah mm. has been about that. And guess what? It continues today. And I tell folks, we have to call them out. But also, I share this with you, that it's not just Jolene Byrne. I had shared this with folks, that when they went after Commissioner Yusuf Shabazz, they went after Yusuf. Then also, they were trying to go after Estella. They went after Bobby Hill. So they went after, this has been a pattern for them to go and do this. Yeah. But then other mm -hmm. people, they stay away from. They didn't go after John Recycus. They didn't go after labor commissioners who were engaging in activities right here that you had the Georgia Guardian that again, Albert Scardino, that when he not finally exposed them, but he not leave Savannah. So everyone knew what was happening. That's the thing that amazes me about our media. They know what's going on, but they choose not to say anything and to mislead the public. That cannot happen. That's why forms like Better Savannah is needed, as I say, to be that fifth estate. You know, this will do the fourth estate and not question everyone in society, but they don't do it. And so instead, they go and push and pry with the gods again, this madness of, uh, you know, they're not professional enough. Get out of here with that. Yeah. Guess what? Elected, the people are the ones who elect people to office. So anyone in this community, if they have only a third grade education, if they fit the bill to not be elected servant, that can happen. And I don't care if they're splitting their finitives. It doesn't matter. You, If you are intelligent, then you understand what they're saying. If you are intelligent, if you're ignorant, then guess what? You don't understand. So you might not need to be in the position that you say that you that the title that you're holding and possessing. So again, I tell folks that when you look at those four women in particular, those four women are from here. They grew up here. They have seen issues that have gone and resonate in their communities since they were children. Now, is that not insane for them not to want to see a change when they are now some of them are grandmothers? That is absolutely ludicrous. But then some of us think it's okay to just toe the line of segregation. You'll be some of the same people that were saying that segregation was okay. 
they've been down with Lester Maddox. They're down with Lester Maddox. They've been down with J.B. Stoner. Now, some people out there might not know J.B. Stoner. J.B. Stoner was a virulent racist. And actually, people here used to laugh when he came on top. They, they would hear him talk about the N-word and all this other stuff. And so guess what? The Savannah Morning News and their supporters have been down with that type of madness. They're down with less dramatic. So I'm saying, <clears throat> yes, they have often been on the wrong side of history and have not been progressive. We need to have a progressive voice in the city. And so now what's occurring is media outlets such as yourselves, like the ATR, who are now putting out that being that alternative that has been necessary because for approximately 10 years, we didn't have it. And the Savannah Morning News could castigate anyone. And they did that to our elected officials, our elected servants, and community advisors. That's why going back even in time to Bobby Hill and others. Well, uh, let me go ahead, go ahead, John. I, I, I just want to stay in the motif and mention two words. It's uh, like the Savannah Morning News is uh, uh, fighting for the lost cause, and they're going to be the redeemer. Okay, that's we know what that means. That's what's going on, and. You're absolutely right. Uh, Julius Hall, ATR, uh, Candidly Keisha, all, all the programming that's surfaced as a reaction to the heavy hand and the biased hand of the media is our counterbalance to it. And it's a pr privilege and an honor to be part of that new voice and that new sound that people voted for in 2019. Chuck, what do you got? Well, I, I was just going to ask, you know, you have these longstanding relationships with a lot of these leaders, uh, both elected on council and elsewhere. You know, I, I think when we were, I always go back to the November 2019, John, you know, me, you and Maria were driving around to those parties and just like, <laughs> we're losing that, that like 11 o'clock hour when we realized, holy crap, everybody won. They'd all you know? It's what uh, I, I, I was like, I'm like, I, I think in the aftermath, we thought, well, look, there'll be a floating majority on council, you know, on on this issue, you'll get, you know, Stella and Bernetta and Dietrich and, and, and the ladies, uh, the, all, all the large older women. And on this issue, you might get the mayor and, and Palumbo and Purdy and. And, and Keisha, you know, like we all kind of just thought, okay, on different issues, there's going to be this floating majority. And what we've seen instead is on the by and by for the most crucial votes, right? I mean, everybody's going to vote to give the honor agenda, you know, the, the key, the key to the city, right? To so-and-so who deserves it. Everybody's going to vote mm. for that. But the votes that matter, there seems to have been this uh, solidified five to four majority, Um I I'm I am not casting aspersions on anybody in particular, but I would just say I've talked to a bunch of people about the mayor, and it's not just these four women. I I, I find that the mayor has bad relationships with other people, even in the local Democratic Party, other elected officials. I, I just am shocked that there's not more of a bridge between these two sides. On the surface, these are all nine Democrats. At least they all voted in a Democratic primary in the last five years, right? Uh, you'd think that they would have some common ground, some room to compromise, but there doesn't seem to be a lot. And then when we talk about Adam Van Bremer, he's writing this narrative as if it's these four women who are lockstep in line, when honestly, I, I see Bernetta and Estella breaking away from... Alicia and Keisha several times. I mean, they don't get along on every vote. They are, they are, they are bantering back and forth with each other about various issues. Sometimes when it's better for the district, Keisha may not agree. I see that all the time, but yet they're writing as if they're the ones who are the lockstep obstructionists. When in reality, it's these five who are re responsible. They're the majority. They're the ones who are governing. So, you know, I, I'm just wondering on, on, on the myriad of things I threw out at you there. Why don't you think there's more room for compromise with the leadership of this mayor? Well, I, I'm going to throw this out there. Um, I tell folks this. Most of us do not know American history. We know American mythology. Most of us don't know Savannah history. We know Savannah mythology. 
we don't know Georgians, we know Georgia mythology. And so that's what we do. We 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 run with the mythologies. We go with that and then and someone can just throw it out at us and then we all embrace it. A part of this issue, just like what you just shared, that there have been some things that with regards to Councilwoman uh, Bryant Lanier, I've not been happy with regards to her position on something. All the women, uh, Bishop uh, Stella Shabazz, there's a position that she's taken that I've not been happy with. But guess what? There are other issues that I support them on. I don't take it personal. And I'm saying if I function like that, then yes, our elected service should do the same thing. And that, this is something that we realize, uh, I'll have to go back in time. What we had shared some 30 years ago, I should say conversations that some of us had some 30 years ago, we had said that Savannah will change when we are not in positions of power. We said that it's all the older people here in the city who have not, who have not experienced what we have experienced, that they're the ones still holding us down. And that's when we didn't realize, or I should say, I didn't realize something when it was related to a school board matter. I didn't realize that, I said, wait a minute, Jamal, you have been saying that all y'all have been saying that when we, Nadra and all of you have been saying that when we not get in positions, we're going to be more progressive. I said, we are in charge now. And we're falling lockstep with regards to the patterns of the past, the old ones. And we're still doing the same thing. We're still engaging in the business for other, other people who are telling them and directing us. And so, yeah, it is dangerous for us to function like that. And for our elected servants that now say, we got to vote this way right here. When I'm like saying, no, even a, a, a traditional thing that they talk about, they take the lead of whatever the council member for that district, uh, their, their sentiments. I disagree with all the women, uh, Stella Shabazz and all the women, Brian Lanier. I disagree with that. You don't do stuff like that because sometimes the all the men or all the women may not have the clarity. You got the clarity, so you got to give it to them or the people in the district, because guess what? They are elected from that particular district, but they represent the entire city of Savannah. So all of us have a say. So anyone, even if I don't live on the east side, I can say something about the east side because I'm still impacted by that. And so we need to have all of our leaders follow that same particular line, that understanding. You work for the best interest of all the people, not a certain segment, and that you don't engage in this cronyism with, on the political scene, that the five of you got to vote together. That's incorrect, because then you're not thinking with clarity. You're just going to go along just to get along with it. It's dangerous for all of us, because history is going to come back, and that's why I'm just waiting on this, too, to let folks know. History is going to show that you have been on the wrong side as elected officials. And when people begin to talk about you and want to tout you, some of us are going to say, no, they were absolutely wrong and incorrect on some of this. Now, when it comes down to what has happened regarding COVID, the mayor has done an excellent job. When we've had disasters, he's done an excellent job. Absolutely. But now with regards to other areas, I can go and critique the mayor and say, well, no, that's not how we need to handle this. We might need to look at poverty dumping that's happening in West Savannah. <laughs> that's poverty dumping. So we don't need to go with that. So I can disagree with the mayor about that, but still applaud the mayor on other things. But some of the, the people under the, uh, I should say, other council women, members, I look at them just falling in line. Now I'm like saying, stop this. Be independent in your thoughts. Right now, you all may not be aware of this. The Leisure Services Bureau for the city of Savannah has not been functioning. So we have children just out there right now. And you have... Coaches that have gone to all the gone to council members to ask them, can you open this up? And they're like refusing. They're saying that they got to take it to the council. We like saying, wait a minute, you are a council member. You can spill voice for this. And that's why I'm going to say that's that lockstep mentality that's going on. Whereas, again, you know the people need something to do. Our young people, and I'm like, if you're really concerned about them, you'll make some things happen. Here, I, I go over to Lake Mayor. I hear activity happen at the fields over there that with regards to, and some of it is tied to the county. I'm like, so if the county can do certain things, why is the city not doing it? And why are we not calling it out? And here go elected officials. Again, all the persons who are saying they got to take it to the council, we're like saying, no, it's not. you the one, you're an elected official. You can bring that before council and say, we need to open up these doors because our children have nothing to do. Yeah, we're, we're you know, you know we're, we're getting the same analogous deal going on with this Forsyth Park thing with street 
uh, you know, part, part of the big issue, Dr. Torre, is should Whitaker and Drayton be one lane instead of two to preserve the park, create safety, et cetera, et cetera. And you got older people saying, well, the traffic engineering department. That's a, they're saying it's a non-starter. It's non-negotiable. No, it went away. The, the traffic engineering department won't let us. I mean, for, for God's sake, you're the elected official. The charter gives you that power, that authority, that standing. Don't take it from a streets department. The other thing, and, and, and I want to toss it back to Chuck, but uh, Dr. Torre, is this not philosophically, historically, kind of like the difference between um, uh, uh, Booker T. Washington's go slow, uh, wait uh, your turn type of mentality versus the Frederick Douglass, uh, W.E.B., the, the voice. Uh, let us have it. Well, it may be messy, but it's ours and, and we'll sort it out. I, am I too far off on that? Uh, you, you are not. And what, is, and what is so sad? What is so sad? Guess what? In Savannah, Georgia, in Savannah, the mentality was a progressive thought. You have Booker T, yes, and Du Bois. Guess what? Du Bois came to Savannah often, and he cultivated relationships right here. Du Bois understood that what was happening, because Savannah was progressive. He saw progressive African Americans right here saying, I need you all to support me in what, I, what I'm doing, the right. Niagara movement. And guess what? The Niagara movement then becomes a catalyst for the NAACP. So Du Bois came to Savannah, Georgia to talk to folks. And one of them is Chuck's former, as I said, Chuck's uh, uh, president, first president of Savannah State, Major Richard R. Wright. He's talking to Major Richard R. Wright. They're all in line and they're about progression. They're yeah. also leaders in the Republican Party. They are fighting on behalf of the people and they were con confrontational. So when people say we should just get along, no, hell no, that's not what it's about. Richard R. Wright, William Monroe Trotter, uh, Du Bois, along with Monroe Works, they all were fighting for the people. Reverend James Sims, and that's who somebody was criticized by the Savannah Morning News. Here you go, Sims, one of the greatest leaders of all time in the state of Georgia. Here you go, he's criticized by Savannah Morning News. That's why I use that as an example. But they were saying, no, we got to challenge the John DeVos. See, John, Colonel John DeVos of the Savannah Tribune, the original Savannah Tribune, he was conservative. He wanted to go slow. But then what happened in Savannah, there's this elite that has been here in our community. You have in the Caucasian community and also African-American. John DeVos was part of the Negro elite, the color elite in the city, who wasn't concerned about the people. But Richard R. Wright, uh, Reverend E.K. Love at First African Baptist Church, Reverend James Sims, Bishop Henry McNeil Turning, when he was there, they are concerned about the people. And they were raising a ruckus. They said that, basically, I throw it out there like somebody said, democracy is not a pretty thing, that democracy calls you to have to put the voices out there. That's why I say, if your denomination is Protestant, guess what? You came out of protest. So it is not anything different today. But people try to act like, oh, no, we're supposed to get along. No, it's not. Members on council, if they disagree, they can disagree. And so they should not be falling lockstep because some of the stuff hurts the Waters Avenue area that you're not even thinking about, Daffin Park. Nobody's on Daffin Park when our children should be on Daffin Park. It is dangerous when we now begin to experience issues in this community and it's tied to those hands that, again, as I say, we're going to call you out with regards to say that you could have saved some of this, could have prevented some of this, but you chose not to because you want to follow lockstep. But you are absolutely right, right, Commissioner McMaster. It is the same mentality, the same line that some people, they were saying it's okay to have segregation. This is black folks. And now I'll throw it out there. W.W. W. Law talked about them too. And see, that's why I put some stuff. See, what I do often, I just try to plant some seeds. To put it out, to let people grab it and then let it be nurtured. W.W. W. Law called out black leadership in this city when they went against the efforts of the civil rights movement. And in fact, the King Tisdale College in Savannah, right there on Huntington, was mm -hmm. put there specifically by law. So then that way to rub it in the face of a minister who was opposed to integration. Law did that. So I tell people, so so now y'all going to talk about this Dr. King stuff and like it's all uh, sweet and nice. And y'all talk about WW Law, but y'all going to talk about how Law also made sure. And he called people and he called people out. The same thing they said that Reverend Smalls has said, 
Law said that specifically about black leadership here, but all of a sudden we forget about it. So no, I'm saying to you, you are absolutely correct. And this mentality has to end. And but we've groomed people to not go and so carry on that father, carry on that that they're the father for these people. Dr. Ture, uh, I often go back to the book um, by Haynes Walton on black third political parties. And um, it's one of my favorite books. It's one of the best texts that fill in. Yeah, you got a copy. Awesome. <laughs> He's going to go grab it right now in his office. Yeah. So talking about that book and following the conversation about Up From Slavery by Booker T. Washington and also um, um, the, the boys, you know, if we talk about access to um, to the political process, that book uncovers an important conversation where it's not about the political party, it's about representation and the people that fought and it didn't matter what side it was, they fought in order to get access. So what you're talking about, are you talking about equity? Because it sounds like more than just inclusion. We're talking about the entire gamut. We're talking about reformation. Same thing with you all talk. We're talking about reformation. We're talking about correcting the system. And so when you said that, uh, well, now I will share this with y'all if you're not aware, and I've said this to people. I am a Walter Knight. This is what Dr. Walton taught us. Dr. Walton told us that basically, listen here, that you look at things first as to how it benefits your people with regards to any policy. And if it's not impacting people harmfully, then you can support the policy. But if it's impacting the people who have been oppressed, who have been marginalized, then you got to find alternatives with regards to that. That's what Walton taught us at Savannah State. That's why some people, when they talk about Haynes Walton, we tell folks, when you know Haynes Walton, you've been taught by him, you still carry that torch. That's what I do right now, carrying the torch. That again, speaking up for the people that sometimes their voices are low. So you got to speak the voice for them. And so, yes, it's about the entire reformation that we want to bring about a system, bring about a society, bring about a city where everyone's able to achieve that they're not being hindered, they're not being thwarted. And so, and that our elected officials must understand when we critique them, it is not personal, it is about we want you to have the best policy. So when you said that, John, Commissioner McBasters, about what they were saying with park and tree and engineering, yeah. guess what? The same thing happened over with regards to the arena development. For years, the communities over there had told them what they wanted to have done, but city staff told them it couldn't happen. So now what happened last year, we are at a meeting and the city staff began to tout the very thing that people had said. So Victor Cooper and I looked at one another like, wait a minute. Y'all told us we couldn't, that, that couldn't be done. Now, all of a sudden, I say, because it's a new administration. That's when now you can go and do that. So here go, not listening to the people, but then here go, elected officials saying, well, this is what we were told by our staff. I tell people, guess what? It is your job to find the alternatives that are least egregious to the people that still advance us. That's your job. That's and it's right. your staff. Like ultimately, yeah. all right, when you say that the engineering department doesn't want this, what you're saying is Michael Brown, the city manager, doesn't want this, right? You know, you know, if Michael Brown won't tell the traffic, you gotta find a new manager. You know, you know, this is the directive. To tell that person they're gonna do it. Find out, you know, again, we waste so much money in this city. You're telling me. You know, if we waste 10 grand, something more, you know, 100 grand on trying to repay Drayton and Whitaker so the park's safer. I don't care if it's over budget. You know, shit, just get the right thing done. You know, I mean, really, this is not the, the, the thing. The problem is when you, you start making decisions, you know, for kind of for kind of the elite. I mean, I remember being a second district resident. We were supposed to have some sub council. You know, we're yeah. going to have all these leaders from the neighborhoods. Well, next week we got three of District Two's neighborhood leaders on our show. I mean, where are they meeting with the district alderman regularly, like you said they would? I don't know, you know. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, Dr. Torrey, you shared you shared an article a couple of weeks ago about WW Law after he passed. Yeah, I see you smiling. You know where I'm going with this. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. You, 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 you shared this letter. I think it was maybe in the Herald or, or yes. maybe, 
I was one of the papers, you know, and um, letter to the and here we have our mayor here. lauding WW Law for that style you described. Yes, and and, and yet we it's have appropriation. It's just simple say, appropriation. Wow, and, and I mean, it, I, you're it, saying more than I would there, but I mean, I think it's it's definitely a, a double standard. I mean, you know, you call you're saying Leonard Small, Reverend Small here is out of line, right? But you're lauding somebody who would have said that and worse about, I mean, honestly, Reverend Small is being nice with what he's saying. I mean, there are way worse ways to say what he is saying. And so, you know, I just find what you shared to be heavily ironic and you shared it without a lot of commentary. So I want to give you some chance to provide some here. <laughs> what I was doing, again, as I shared, it's just about planting the seeds. I want the folks to see that and then for people to begin to ponder. In particular, the groupies, that when you're not going to talk about, and, and again, I would say the Adam Brimmers and other Van Brimmers and others, when they're going to talk about this type of stuff, that now they're going to say, wait a minute. Just as you, what you just did, Brother Chuck, when you now question, you say, wait a minute, how can they like critique these ladies today when we're in laud in lauding this person right here because that's what he did. To, he did the same exact thing. And I want us in the community in particular, I want us who are looking at all of this to now understand. That's why these alternative media sources like Better Savannah, ATR, that we got to champion them. We got to listen to them because you all provide the vehicles for us now to get the right information. Because we understand that propaganda goes on. And that's, again, about propaganda. And I want to show the sheer hypocrisy of people when they try to criticize them, saying it's absolute hypocrisy. And guess what? It was in, it was a it, it was a letter to the editor to the Savannah Morning News. It was the Savannah Morning News that published that. So I want everybody to see, oh, look at Savannah Morning News. They they published the letter, and you see what our mayor says when he's an alderman about WW Law. And that when Law felt that things were not right, Law called him up or talked to him or told him or Law saw him. Law went off at times and Law did that with everybody. So that wasn't anything unusual. So I'm like saying, so how we have such short-term memory, it is shameful. I'm talking about the political groupies and other people who want to try to criticize. I'm like, it always happened here. So don't try to act brand new about it. It seems that if people can't um, be criticized or take critique anymore, that they feel like that's a sharp knife to the side in their ego or their power, and it's not. Yeah. And, Chuck, and guess what? what? And, and that was part of Haynes Walton teaching. That was the teaching of Haynes Walton Jr. That's what he taught us. And so some of us, we live true to that, and that's why you call that. All we do, we exhibit what we've been given. That was Victor Cooper. Walton taught us this. He gave us this right here. So that's why we function like that. Najanee Enzi. That's why we function like this. Uh, uh, Dwight Jordan down in McIntosh County, that's why we function like this. Walton has students and scholars who are now in Congress right now, working in Congress, and it's the same mentality. This is what we were created. This is the category of people that were being created. We were not the people who just sort of sit on the sideline and just be quiet when we see injustice occurring in the city. That's why I said we want to see reformation of our communities in all avenues. Chuck. What you got? Rules package. Talk about yeah. it. I, you know, Dr. Torre, uh, if there's one item action that this council has done that I think is the, the, the plurality of the source of division, it's the single largest source of division on this council, it's the fact that the mayor changed the traditional rules package in April 2020, uh, which in effect limits any individual member from placing an item on the agenda, all right? So, you know, the last 20 years before, you know, you were a member of council, you would, you would tell the clerk and the manager, you know, just stick this under my name, you know, we'll talk about it, maybe vote on something. And uh, that was how it worked. Well, now, if the mayor and city manager don't want it on the agenda, post rules package, you have to have five co-sponsors if they have five members of council, which is a majority, enough to enact legislation uh, just to get something on the agenda. Now, we have connected this, not directly, but I mean, you know, as soon as this council took in office, 
you had uh, Gordon Matthews writing a letter to the delegation about potential charter changes and the like, and then this happens 90 days later. So what are your thoughts on that change? It seems to be limiting democracy, and this was on a five to four vote. So again, every member who voted for it is responsible, right? What are your thoughts on the rules package? Well, I'm going to say this to you, my brother Chuck, <laughs> acting just like an outlaw right now, acting just like an outlaw. His fraternity, Idol Phi Theta, <laughs> known as the Outlaws, and he's being an outlaw right now because, well, when this happened, I said to folks, this is going to have a chilling effect on our elected officials, and but not just our elected officials, on the votes of everyone, all the citizens who voted for the candidates and who now became our elected servants, that this has a chilling effect, but not just now, but guess what? And, and, and well, I'm going to throw this out and then come back, that it has a chilling effect that if we now have a different city council, guess what? This legacy will still linger and still impact us later on. So guess what? If we have a majority uh, city council who are anti the community and just absolutely pro-business, guess what? That's going to affect all of us in this city right here. We have now set a standard, a precedent that's going that we should all been up in arms about. And that when that occurred, and again to show you how we've been lulled into just getting along just because we know them because that's our church member, that's our friend, that's our family member, that's our brother, that's our sister, that's our cousin, that what we have now allowed was that the next council, the next mayor can do the same thing and that our voices will not be heard. So that means that you lost your vote. And I dare say, and I shared the folks, the entire black community should have been screaming at this. Right. But guess what? silence. Lower income Caucasians in this city should have been screaming at this. Silence. Latinos and Asians here, silent. Single the people, all of us should, who have been marginalized in this city should have been screaming at that tactic right there. And still, even today, no one is saying anything about it. It is frightening and it has a chilling effect on our elected servants being able to bring issues up. That's why I'm like, what is this insanity? That is absolute insanity. But then it's also going to become a tool of oppression. So I'm throwing it out there. So I know what's going to happen in the next council, because we know council is going to change, even with regard to the mayor is going to change because the mayor has only one other term the mayor can run for. After that, we have a new mayor in place. And if that mayor is pro-business and pro-elitism, Guess what? That means the marginalized people, you're going to be in the worst situation when he now has or she has her cronies that will go do the same thing. And then I'm going to go back and say, you know, when that happened in 2020, that we sat back and allowed it to occur and no one said anything. And so now look at your parents and your grandparents and ask them, why did they allow that to go on? Why they never said anything? Why they never had any heart? It is frightening, Chuck. It is frightening, brother. Let me connect this to our next topic, because I just want to throw this out there. I know probably 1,500 people in Savannah watch this show every week. And we're watching this special election forming for House District 165 for Representative Stevens, who is resigning, retiring soon. And the special election is supposed to be announced soon. I don't know the details yet, but it's supposed to be coming very shortly. Uh, this is a non-negotiable issue. If you will not sponsor a bill to update the charter, to empower, at the very least, something with two people, a sponsor and a co-sponsor on council, to get something on the agenda. If you will not change this charter, why would we support you? Why? Detail. You will drop the bill next session. You will get the delegation to take a vote on it. This is a commitment you have to take if you want progressive support in this special election. And make no mistake, House Station 165, that's a progressive leaning seat. You know, that's a Democratic seat. So I just want to connect that to this issue. What do you think about this potential special election coming in the next two months here? You know, will you agree with us that this issue on the charter change for the agenda mm -hmm. should be a non-negotiable? Well, absolutely, because I said it's a chilling effect. 
that again, we are in, we'll be put in a position that again, if you have a again, you, if you have a council that's not progressive, and you may have a few, you may have three people who are progressives, and they may want to do some things, have some great ideas, and some things that need to help benefit the people here, and they're thwarted from doing that because they have five, they have six other council members that can just shut them down. But then that, again, that goes back to again. What is the fundamental right for all of us? And I should throw this out there. In 2016, there was a poll done with regard to seven European nations and citizens of the US. And one of the fundamental rights that they said that all human beings should have is the right to vote. So guess what? We now, our vote now has been knocked down, knocked out of our hands. Our ballots have knocked out of our hands. It's been diluted. Have, it's been diluted for sure. Suppressed. We, suppressed. We, 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 can't, we, we can't go and put our slip inside the bowl like it used to happen. We can't do that anymore because now our elected official, our elected servant doesn't have a voice anymore. And they can be ostracized and isolated. And we think it's okay, or excuse me, because your silence says it's okay. And we need to change that. Um, look, 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 let me be silly rhetorical devil's advocate here, uh, Dr. Torre does not creating a dozen task forces that pick up the mantle of progressive issues and policy, does that change anything? Are they really progressive though? That's the thing. Well, Are the people, no, I'm the just- topics, it The topics of, of interest, many of them are uh, police reform, task force, uh, 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 gay, gay rights and, and, and unification task forces, housing task forces. Um, you, you know, Chuck and I have, you know, this critical skeptical view that these are uh, uh, sleight of hand illusions to give the appearance of concern and effort on progressive subjects, but there are seats at the table, remember? Yeah, uh, I, I just think it's going to be more, more bluster than product, and and they're they're little, the the numbers associated with these are are so big. It just suggests, you know, you've worked in groups before. How do you expect a, a task force of sixty people? to get down to the bottom line and really do something meaningful. Now, John, can we add a nuance to this? Sure. I, and I want to hear Dr. Teray's feedback on the, the, just to add a nuance. It feels a lot like these groups to be a part, you have to be in the nucleus of the group. Do you think that there's also aspect of nepotism and clientelism? in these task force to be to get a seat at the table well and that's why i was in the process of answering as soon as commissioner masters had asked the question i was but then i was saying are they really progressive are these people are, the people who are serving on them are they progressive and sister carrie what it goes to yes some of the people that you see on these task forces that they are part of a, a group some of them are political groupies some of them have special interests with regards to them. again, they are not the ones who are gonna do the critical thinking. They're gonna go, they're gonna rubber stamp. And then, and when I say rubber stamp, they'll push on the things that they think that should be rubber stamped by the city, by the council, by, by, by the city government, that these are not independent. They're not, you bring in a cross section of people that you know, that's why I say methodologies. My methodology for one to have to get to a goal is gonna be different than someone else. But put us on the task force together, then we can come up with a synthesis. But that's what we have been saying that again, it doesn't matter about your name, it's about the action. It's not about just using a name that sounds progressive and it's okay with regards to the name being sweet. But guess what? Guess what? Cotton candy is sweet. But if you eat a lot of cotton candy, your teeth are gonna get rotten, it doesn't sustain you. We got to have the meat and potatoes or you will need to have the vegetables and the fruits. That's what we need to have something that is substantial and we need substantial action. So some of the folks on the task forces that they have, again, it is not, I'm not going to say it's popularity, 
But again, it's people who can just get along and they will sometimes not go full ahead with regards to the progressive changes that are needed because they are some of them are lukewarm and that's how they think, lukewarm, as opposed to being the people with the new dynamics thoughts and looking at and going around, not saying that um, we're the only ones with intelligence, but grabbing the sources, the people who are right here, grabbing some of you and having you on it. So then that way, again, we're more forward thinking. So absolutely, it is tied to, I'm going to say the, the cronyism is tied to, with regards to, again, uh, people who will not challenge the status quo. I, I've shared this because I've had history in, of working with uh, substance abuse programs here in the city, HIV, AIDS, and mental health. And one of the things I told some folks tied to some organizations right here in the city, when it comes down to funding, trying to get the money from United Way, they'll bring out certain clients. They bring those clients out, and they have the Savannah Morning News to write articles on how this person has made changes. I told folks, I said, check this out. I'm not concerned about that person right there, because that person did everything you told them to do. I said, you make your money on that person who refused to do some of the things that you told them to do to advance their lifestyle, to make them a better person. I said, you earn your money when that person not does that 180 who will go and say to you, you know what? I resisted everything you told me in the beginning, but guess what? I began to listen and I saw how my life changed. Yes, I was a knucklehead when you first met me, but guess what? I've not done this, I've not achieved. I said, that's where you earn your money. And so we want to have people like that who are going to sometimes not necessarily get along with you, but who are also going to be able to advance your cause with regards to your efforts. So I tell folks, you earn your money when you're not able to pull everyone into it, regardless if they get along or they don't get along, you not earn your money when you can pull everyone together, pull those who are resistant and those who are complying. Well, I think, you know, I, I've had this frustration because, you know, I, I see that there is all across the South, this emergence of black progressive politics. Hmm. And you can look at cities like Jackson, Mississippi, Birmingham, Alabama, uh, the city of South Fulton outside of Atlanta, which is a brand new city. That's right. Uh, it, is, uh, it is proportionally uh, the blackest city in Georgia. Uh, and, and you see this kind of emergence of a, of a black progressive left. And Savannah seems to be just lagging. I think 2019 was our, our first taste of it. Um, but I think there's a difference between those who run progressively and those who govern progressively. Uh, and, and, and one thing that we're bracing for just not in this only in a special election coming up, but in 2022 cycle, how do we ask better questions? You know, how do we differentiate those two earlier on? Because I mean, we supported the majority of this council, you know, everyone except the mayor, you know, you know, basically you know, either got support or did not receive opposition from us, right? You know, but, but several of them have gone on to diverge and have chosen a different path than what they displayed when they ran. How do we vet that out better in the future? Well, well actually, Chuck, I, I was going to say this, brother, that uh, what has to happen, well, we, we've mm -hmm. actually learned, and that's what has occurred here, because we folks were opposed to the Pride Council. So, not a lot had to be done with regards to, you know, throwing the support behind the alternatives. And that's what occurred. Folks went with the alternatives as opposed to going with the council that was in place. But, and that was something that folks got lulled into. Now folks are able to not question and say, wait a minute, will you fool me once? You will not fool me again. And so with regards to all those who will now want to run, we're going to call you out. But then we also have to hold folks accountable. And then with regards to the words and to their statements and put it out there saying that because you had said this right here, just as you said, Chuck, with regards to the charter, that saying that if you are going to do this right here, we want an open statement, a public statement that this is what you're going to support this. If not, then we cannot support you. And you put them on the spot with regards to because what happened for many of us, we were just happy to achieve. And that's what occurred. We were happy to achieve, just like symbolically, people are happy about happen yeah. that the conviction yeah. yesterday with the gods of two days ago with the gods of Derek Chauvin, that they're just happy with that symbolically. But now understand there's a lot of other work that's needed. We have to make sure folks understand the work has to be done continuously with the gods of holding elected officials accountable and not letting them just slide by. 
because we got fooled. We got fooled by people because, and but I'll tell you this, the signs were there with some people. Some signs were there with regards to how they behaved towards certain candidates, uh, fellow candidates. If the signs were there, but then people ignored it because again, we were more focused on the council that was in place as opposed to now assessing these people individually. And that's what we have to do, just hold them accountable. And that again, this is not anything personal, but this is actual and factual for us to function as a democracy. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not, oh, see, we're critical of the Republicans. The Republicans saw that they had lost, so they're not trying to rectify how people are able to not vote. So we get mad at the Republicans, but we don't call out Democrats when they're doing things that are not helpful to us as a people, as a community. That's why I'm saying that has to go out the window. We call everyone out to be fair. And that's why I tell folks, I'm merely doing what I've been taught to do, to call out matters that, again, that I think are unfair. If you can show me a way to, to explain to me why it is fair, then I'm like, okay, I'll listen to you. Uh, as opposed to not turn the deaf ears, just deny fellow council members a right to put something on their agenda or deny the people from having voices. Yes, absolutely. We, the changes have to occur. And this is a totality that we got to be about. So next year, and so now with regards to the special election, that that's still up in the air, whether there's going to be a special election or just be election in 2022, that we need to make sure that we call out all those people who are saying they're going to run to make sure. And that, again, it's not about looking out for just one community. And I'm going to throw something out there right now. It's going to be pissed. People get pissed off about it, that when you talk about race issues here in Savannah, across this entire country, not just it. When you talk about race issues, that's the hard issue that people don't want to talk about. You can talk about gender. You can talk about sexual orientation. You can talk about economics. And that's the easy stuff. The race issue that people don't want to talk about because then that's when you look at the absolute marginalization right there that then impact the gender, the sexual orientation, and the income. But we don't want to talk about it because then it hurts our feelings. It hurts the friends of our feelings and our supporters because now we're getting support from other people that are going to give us $2,500, but then also try to tell you, you think that you now owe them your entire political life. And that's how some of us function right now. A, a big part of the philosophy that I brought to this project at Better Savannah is, is best summed up in a, in a book the last two years called Winners Take All by Anand Girdadas, who's a writer for the New York Times. And Savannah is such a great microcosm of this yeah. issue of, of whitewashing the problems. And what I mean by that is you take United Way, right? United Way, for an example, they collect money mostly from corporations, mm -hmm. okay? Corporations who are regulated in part or in whole by the local, state, and federal governments and lobby candidates, you know, politicians, elected officials, and their staffs for lax treatment and lower taxes or getting out of their taxes. Uh, and then with that money that they have gotten away from not giving the government, turn mm -hmm. around and then have the control and direction of the nonprofit resources which are used to you know, bring about social change. So it's not only are we getting our votes suppressed at the ballot box, not only are they getting suppressed with the rules package at council, you know, the, this is the de-democratization of social change, right? You know, who's controlling where that money goes, right? You know, who's really in the ear of the head of Tony O'Reilly at the SBAC doling out CARES Act funding $2.7 million last year, right? These are the points of, of power and influence and levers that are very minutiae and very small uh, and not sexy like an ethics complaint or, you know, this or that, you know, so it's just not like something that, that gets into the news very easily, but there are those of us who see it and then are appalled. You know, I, I, I'm just so frustrated with what I've seen the last 16 months. I mean, you know, I, I, I got to see some change but this is why we have expanded to the other centers of power, the delegation, the county. You know, we can't allow the city to run amok. You know, there are other levers of power which can control them a little bit, contain it. Absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And, and that's what has occurred. And so, and it's sad that when um, the pain and the grief that some people experience, that they now allow that to blind them to the pain and the grief of other people. 
and then particularly to their citizens, that they to their electorate. That that is shameful, and that's why I say that's why it's hypocritical. And that when we talk about this, is again, we're not put. We're, we're, it's not anything personal. This is about just looking at the action and saying, hey, we have to be better. And that's what I expect. Because I tell folks, I'm a proud Savannah. I'm a proud Savannah. I was with people today. I tell them, I'm a proud Savannah. They ask me, they say, what is the best side? What, what is the side of Savannah that you like? And I said to them, I said, I like all of Savannah. I love all of Savannah. I said, there's not a part of Savannah that I dislike. I said, I love all of Savannah. I said, I'm a proud Savannah. I let people know that. I go and brag about my city. So guess what? That means that I have a concern about my entire city, not just one component, but all of my city. I want to throw the challenge out there to tell people, we improve all the Savannah. We improve all the Savannah. Guess what? We have a better Savannah. We improve the lives of the smallest to the weakest people in the city. Guess what? Our lives will be better. And that, those are the children that we have right here that we're not looking out for with regards to how we should be looking out for them without doing our due diligence. The smallest and the weakest ones, guess what? They then will come strong and they'll take us to another level. And we all can then be proud of. I wanna I wanna end with this topic or, or maybe one more after this, John, here before we wrap up. Can I make uh, a quick I, comment? For go you? ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I want you to notice that Dr. Torre just channeled the John Adams message about Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> okay, you gotta be positive in, in your messaging Otherwise, you just become a bummer and nobody wants to vote for you or work with you. So thank you, Dr. Torre. <laughs> I want to I wanna end talking about the weeping time uh, uh, property issue. Of all of the contentious five to four votes so far in this term, um, this one to me feels the most consequential. Uh, as somebody of Jewish descent, you know, I was moved by Reverend Small, uh, his, 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 his speech at council, mm -hmm. comparing the land to Dachau and Auschwitz. I, I found that very apropos. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can speak on this better than either of us can. You know, what are your thoughts on how this went down? The, 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 the contents of the occasion of that meeting, which I think you were there, or I'm sure at least watching uh and, and in general the history of this property in this in this issue well, well you know with regards to the historical legacy and, and we've been a part of some documentaries that tied to that and that with regards to what we saw happen in savannah it, again the largest sale of african people in the entire united states now i'll share this with you now folks over in natchez and folks in the road they're gonna say that they had over in natchez but then i'm like hey hey we know that it's a transition, and that is a transition that happens with the God to people and their families. And this transition is not just tied to Savannah, because we know the story is tied to McIntosh County and also Glen County, Georgia. So we see the ripping apart of families. We see the destruction of families. We see that occurring. And that, again, and it happened right here in Savannah, Georgia. And so we have a historical marker over there. We have conversations about it. But for me, and I tell folks, I understand about respecting history. I understand that. But I also understand about respecting communities. And that's why for me, that I and I share with folks, I say that I'm not going to get into an issue, uh, argument with you about the history. I'm not going to argue with you about that. But I'm going to talk to you about and say, I got an issue about poverty dumping, that you're dumping poverty into West Savannah. You have people who are homeless. And again, for me, I've been a homeless advocate. I've been there. I have done that for some eight years of my life. I have done that. And I understand the ramifications when you go and just put us all in one area. And that's why I did a video and talked about at Cohen's retreat, at Cohen's retreat, what happened going back in the first decade of 2000, there was something a homeless family transitional facility over there. And the entire community over in Bacon Park, they're up in arms about it. And that's why I said, now here go people in West Savannah not trying to say that. And here goes people in West Savannah do not have the same economic resources as over in Bacon Park. That is something to income in general. But what happens now, the council then decides to just dump it and that's it. Then also when you then go about doing the scary list stuff with the guards that libeling, slandering, defaming one of your own council members, I'm like, that is insane. That, when you say contentious Chuck, that's the type of stuff I'm looking at. I'm like saying, you got council members and see no one called those council members out. Who did that? Who planted the seed? Going back to Commissioner McMaster's about Savannah Morning News, 
who were planning to see Savannah Morning News and also with WTOC and others that now go and defame a council member. Frightening, chilling that this occurred and no one has called any of them out. But you can address the four councilwomen because they wanted to say, no, it shouldn't happen like that. Let's explore this more. Even when they went and said, let's do archaeological research with the guards, said, yes. Then, now I'm going to throw it out there. And the NPC, I was saddened to see what, how the NPC function in this also because they are contributors to this issue right here. And the city council are able to use that as a way. And it's shameful that, again, we have African-Americans in leadership positions here who are not sensitive to their own story. But guess what? This is why I share it, folks. That's how oppressed people function. That is how oppressed people psychologically will function. And that's why we're not. I looked at it, I said, this is oppressed people functioning. I didn't understand why the NPC was just held up as some, you know, golden truth. Like these maps from 40 years ago are for sure 100% accurate. How, how do we know? I mean, this is the government 45 years ago, you know, was openly hostile to every black person, you know, in this town. You know, so I, I mean, I mean, how do we know that this institution is even being honest? And then even go and say, well, don't look at the, the maps from the 1800s. Legally, that's what you should be doing because that's a black map. But then we justify it. And so here I'm looking at people on the council, MPC, and I'm saying to myself, like, this is insane. And that goes to show you that these are people who are not open minded that they have an agenda in place and they push that agenda. And so I say to the citizens here in chat in Savannah, we need to rethink some of this right here. We need to be voices and listen to the, again, these alternative newscasts and these news sources for us from Better Savannah to ATR, all the shows on ATR, that now begin to grasp, okay, we gotta have an alternative to WTOC, to uh, Savannah Morning News because they are gonna be on the wrong side of history and you're gonna need to answer to your grandchildren where did you stand on this? And don't create the mythology how you were supportive because some of us are going to call you out and say, no, you didn't support it. And that's a lie because you're like in the civil rights movement. Just to throw it out there, some of y'all may not be aware. Some of the people in Savannah, Georgia, African-Americans, leaders who said they were part of the civil rights movement in Savannah were they not playing the roles that they were doing and they contend. And they think because some of y'all are so young, that you all don't know any better, but there are sources that can go and tell you, people who can go and tell you, they weren't around when some of this happened. So that's why I throw that out there. They can talk about WW law all they want, but they were not around with law, so they don't know some of it. And that's why some of them just say, oh, don't worry about weeping times because they have never been historically been relevant to us truly. They've not been a part of the movements. They've done one little thing and that was it. I'm like, no, you gotta be consistent about this. And so again, the contentious behaviors of our council members, don't look at the four, look at the others also and call them out about it. But you got politicians telling other politicians, you cannot be my friend and be their friend too. That's insane. That's crazy. To the delegation Dr. Trey, there was an article that uh, Adam Van Bremer came out with um, just like this week. And it was very uh, damaging to how he presents uh, the four women on council. Do you think that he would have a different rhetoric if he was not a white man? Actually, he could be African American because we have African Americans right here also who share his same sentiments. Mm -hmm. They have the same mentality. They engage in conversations about those four council women. Because, of course, by him being a Caucasian male, he has a certain perspective because, again, he understands that this is, well, I'm going to say the election that occurred here in Savannah on that city council, it was shaking the foundation of some of our... our exactly. The Savannah leaders. Morning News had to sell. They sold. They sold, they sold. to Gannett. So, so they are they are frightened by what has happened. Then they understand that these are people that they had no control over. That's what happened. When they not saw, the because they, they didn't think that they were going to win. They didn't think that Alderman Keisha Gibson Carter was going to win. They didn't think that uh, Alderman, uh, they did not want Alderman Brian Lanier to win. They didn't think that Alderman Shabazz, they didn't want, well, she had no opposition, but they didn't want her to win. And then with regards to Alicia Miller Blakely, they didn't think that Alderman Miller Blakely would win. They thought it was going to be, again, the same old business yep. at hand. But when they then won, it was a voice that was heard by them saying, change must come progressive behaviors and policies must come about. So they had to then go and seep in 
And we give another group of them and let them understand, listen, you have experience. You know how it should be. And so now you have these people now saying, oh, y'all get along with us. You know, y'all are more responsible. Y'all not, y'all not high-headed and things like that. And so then our egos not get into come into play. And we now start thinking that, oh, these other people like us. And so here go Bremer and the others, they can go and they will go and be insensitive to the issues that are really at hand in this city. But then you have some African Americans also, because if I come and give them just some ego satisfaction, they'll have the same mentality. And that's males and females here, because we have seen African American women here who have been critical of our council women who bought into the narratives, African American men who have been critical of them who bought into the narrative when I go and say, wait a minute, but y'all not criticizing these other people about the stuff that they have said when they telling you say that you can't tell them anything. Elected officials telling folks you can't tell them anything. I'm like, hell, I thought you were our servant. So we should be able to tell you something. Adam Van Brimmer is like, I told you this in a conversation a few days ago, John. Uh, he's like a picture perfect generation X racist. You know, like he he's... He's old enough to know, but young enough to have been trained how to speak in enough coded language uh, to not be perceived uh, as an overt racist. Um, you know, whereas, you know, 35, 40 years ago, you know, the, the editorial would have just been plain and clear and simple uh, why civil rights is, you know, we're not for civil rights. Now, now it's a more you know, it's nuanced, nuanced. It's we, more we nuanced. And, I, and I, and I've said that his, you know, Adam Van Brimmer has clearly had it with Buddy Carter. You know, if you look at his columns, he is constantly trashing Buddy. Uh, and I, I, I have said that, you know, he's using this as kind of this crutch to go, well, look, I'm not a partisan, you know, I, I, Buddy Carter's a horrible trash congressman. I can't wait to see him lose. Therefore, Therefore, what I'm telling you about these four black women on council must be true, right? Because yeah. I have this credibility now that I am not just rooting for old white men. I'll trash them too when they're wrong. But these four black ladies, they're crazy. And, and to say that they have lost any and all respect and trust from all their council colleagues, you know, I think that feeling's mutual, Adam. And Ultimately, it's the voters who are losing trust. That's and right. the voters are losing trust with the outcomes of city government. The outcomes of city government are the responsibility of those five members. Not these Black women who've been voting no. No, they're in the minority. Okay? They're in the minority on most of the top issues. Okay? They are not governing and setting the direction of this council and this government. Michael Brown, Van Johnson are with the support of four votes. It's that simple. And... I very much look forward to Adam Van Brimmer being on the wrong side of history yet again, uh, because it will likely happen. Now, what happens between now and 2023, it's really hard to tell. But I will tell you this, the next 15 to 18 months, 2022 is probably going to be one of the wildest political years in Chatham County's history. I mean, our senior senator is vacating to run statewide for labor commissioner, which is a very timely move in his part, I believe. You know, that opens his seat. We've got Mickey retiring, you know, rumors Carl Gilliard may seek the Senate seat. You know, I mean, there's a lot of shuffling going on. And just like 2019, we've, we've really got an opportunity to have a, a momentous occasion, you know, towards progress. We're, we're going to learn County. from our, we're going to learn from our mistakes. I hope so, John. Which, Jeez. Which we could not have predicted. Right. Dr. Torre. Made me feel a lot better about that. It was really a vote against Eddie's council, and anybody yes. could have got in. Okay. Yes. But this yes. will be the war of the world mm -hmm. in the next election. Yes. And I, I would not bet against a progressive council of the first order coming together. Let me laugh. Well, I can't. I, I, I got to ask one more question because you said, Dr. Troy, we need alternatives. And we're going to need some alternatives on a ballot really, really soon. Oh, you're not. Is that something? Is that something you know you, you you may consider in the next few years? You may consider stepping up for leadership. Uh, of course, that may be an option that's out there. You know. There you go. All we right, all, go ahead. We'll, 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 go we ahead. all should consider this because I tell folks, I tell tell my people, I said, listen, we need you as leaders for today, not tomorrow, 
but today. So that's all of us. That's all citizens. Anyone listening to the show, you know, again, that's what we need to be thinking about. That's right. That's something we have to step up to the plate. Hey, just a, a parting shot I want to share with Dr. Ture. Chuck, you know about it uh, firsthand. One of the most satisfying uh, little vignettes or moments of that 2019 election, Dr. Ture, is I, I made a print of information request to the Chamber of Commerce <clears throat> um, for their tax returns. And uh, I, 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 I picked it up. It was actually delivered. Uh, okay. And there was a manila envelope and a, you know, the quarter ream of paper in there. And on the, on the top of the paper clip was a personal note from Bill Hubbard. Okay. And it said, uh, John, congratulations on your election victory. So uh, yeah. it, that, that was, uh, I'm sure, very hard <laughs> for him. To we, we won the battle, but lost the war, unfortunately, John. Well, yeah, uh, that, that's why uh, let's bring on 2023. Let's keep working together. Let's keep telling the truth, uh, not selling out to anybody for any reason. We're going to make mistakes. It's human. Uh, right. Right. We're, we're going to get it right in this next election, and we're going to have a better city and community that's stronger, more vibrant, and more accessible for everyone. Real quick, Dr. Troy, tell people how they can find you on Facebook, because I think your your commentary videos that you produce, you know, one off are always brilliant and very well timed. How can people find you online? Uh, they can contact uh, Amir Ture, uh, A M I R T O U R E. There are two. I have two Facebook pages, and so um, hit hit us up there. You can contact us. We have a show called Run Tell That that comes on the ATR. Uh, yes. Uh, nothing relevant uh, media page, so we do that. We put it out. When there. does that show come out? A big time on at 6 p.m. And what we do with that show is about empowerment and information. Just again, taking a different perspective with regard to how to better the lives of people, be solutions. And that's what we believe in, being a solution. And I just, just throw something out there, you know, because uh, Earth Day is important to all of us. And I believe Earth Day, uh, John McDonald is one, the one who first had that idea in 1969 in San Francisco at UNESCO conference there. And one of the things for him, he said that, he believes in relieving the pain of all people in the world and for the common good. And that's why I tell people, that's the that's philosophy that I share. In addition, being at Walt tonight, that's the philosophy that I share, relieving the pain of people and doing the common good. And so that's what we try to do. All right. Well, look, before we uh, wrap things up and, and exit, I just want to do a couple of housekeeping notes. If you're, if you, obviously, if you're watching this live, then you're a big follower of our page and our show. Uh, we are, are just considering as things continue to develop with the vaccine rollout, you know, the possibility of a live show later on in the year, uh, maybe over the summer. Uh, if that's something you think we're ready for, you think you'd be interested in, drop a comment. I'd be interested to know, uh, you know, who would want to see us record an episode live uh, you know, maybe later audience. on this year. Yeah, yeah. Just like a, 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 that's a, a special live audience. Live audience, you know, just you know, socially distanced, masks, whatnot. You know, we can we could do the whole gamut, but I I do think that uh, it's something we're considering. And I just want to repeat, recap uh, what I said at the top that next Thursday's show will be a special panel show uh, about the Forsyth Park redesign uh, issue, you know, plans uh, with representatives not only from the Friends of Forsyth Group, which is pushing these plans or presenting them rather is probably a better word, yeah. um, but also representatives from the boards of the three main neighborhood associations surrounding the park, Thomas Square, Victoria Neighborhood, and the Downtown Neighborhood Association uh, will all have representatives uh, on the panel broadcast next week. Uh, we've got a ton of great shows planned uh, over the next few months here, uh, a lot of great projects in line. And then, like I said, we are really paying special close attention to see whether this house district 165 will become a special election over the summer here that will obviously be something that we will you know be very involved in you know either you know both interviewing candidates maybe doing a debate uh and maybe or maybe not endorsing you know just like we did with house district 163 last year you know we may just you know put the much information out there for the voters to decide uh so that they can uh they can make the best decision 
uh, that they can, and it looks like they did in that chance uh, in that race. So, with that, uh, it's eight twenty six. We appreciate everybody stopping by, and you know, for all of you who are listening to this on replay, uh, please feel free to check out our past episodes, several of which we referenced uh, during tonight's show. And thanks so much, Doctor Trey, for Dr. coming Trey. on. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Glad to be here. Glad yeah. to be here. Will you come all right, back? everybody, come back. Come back in the fall. We'll, we'll yeah. bring you back on maybe in the fall here. Okay. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. Right. We look forward to it. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Same to y'all. See ya. Peace.